Hey everybody, hope you're enjoying Global Supply Chain Week. Uh, my name is Greg Miller. I'm senior editor with Freight Waves and American Shipper. Uh, and I'm joined today by uh, Randy Givens, uh, the senior shipping analyst uh, at the investment bank Jefferies. Oh, always great to talk to you. Thanks for joining us, Randy. Absolutely, my pleasure. Thanks for having me, Greg. Yeah. So today, Randy and I are going to be talking about investing uh, in container shipping stocks. Uh, and if you look at the news, uh, you, you can't miss it. Um, uh, there's record congestion in Los Angeles, Long Beach. Uh, there's uh, record imports. There's record freight rates. Uh, this is not the kind of story that's on the trade press anymore or an American shipper. This is in uh, CNBC, the Wall Street Journal, uh, the New York Times. Uh, it's out there. So when people see something like this, uh, one of the things that crosses their mind is, uh, how can we make some money on this in the stock market? And uh, there's three different categories of stocks that we're going to look at. Um, number one would be stocks in the liner companies themselves, the ocean carriers. Uh, number two would be the uh, ship lessors. These are the ship owners that charter the ships to the liners. And number three would be the box equipment lessors. Uh, they own the containers, the container equipment, and they lease those to the liners. So let's Let's start with the liners. And, um, you know, as far as the public equities, you know, the big guys, Maersk is traded in Copenhagen, uh, Hoppig Lloyd's in Germany, Costco's in Asia. Uh, in the U.S. to date, we've had somewhat slim pickings. I mean, we've had, uh, we have Matson, uh, which spun off from Alexander and Baldwin in 2012. Uh, they have high exposure to the Trans-Pacific trade, but uh, they're based in Hawaii and they're very, uh, also exposed to the Domestic Jones Act trades to Alaska and Hawaii, and, and therefore the Hawaii tourism business and so forth. We have Maersk, sort of. Uh, we, they have American depository receipts that are traded over the counter here. Uh, and now we have Zim, uh, which recently concluded an IPO and listed uh, here in New York. So we have some options now. Uh, these guys are directly exposed uh, to these record spot freight rates. So I guess the first question, Randy, is, uh, for just looking at the fundamentals that drive these liner stocks, let's leave the ship lessers aside for a moment, but the liner stocks, uh, what would you say is going on here? Yeah, great question, Greg. We've, we've got a lot of that uh, similar question here for the last six to 12 months. So uh, really, let's just step back to a year ago, right? Around February uh, 2020, things were decent, right? They were okay. Um, and then late February, all of March, you had a vast reduction in liner rates and what they were earning. Uh, a lot of that was because there was not much supply of goods coming out of China. With the coronavirus, COVID-19, all the factory shuts down, there wasn't a, much coming out uh, of the Asian whole economies. And then in April and May, you didn't really have much demand, right? US was going into lockdown, Europe was going into a lockdown, nobody wanted to spend money on everything or on anything. So as a result, you had a very sharp reduction in rates. Now, to kind of to, to counteract some of that weakness in the market, the large liner companies really showed the fruits of the consolidation that has happened over the last five years. And they started blank sailing, right? They started, instead of going five, six, seven times a week uh, from the Asia to US, now they were going once or twice a week, Asia to US, right? To really increase their utilization and to decrease the number of empty boxes uh, and whatnot that were coming across the seas. So that capacity discipline really helped buoy the market in a very terrible time, uh, the first half, let's call it, of 2020. And now in the back half of 2020, things changed rapidly, right? You had all of the Chinese production back online. At the same time, you had a surge in demand for consumer goods and containerized goods throughout the US and throughout Europe. So if you have, for example, $1,000 a month to spend discretionary income, and you're not spending it on airfare, meals, sporting events, concerts, you're like, well, I guess I might buy some electronic bikes and Pelotons and dishwashers and furniture and clothes, all of that being produced in Asia. So you had a big spike in consumer spending, as well as a lot of inventory restocking because the supply chain was so messed up from February to June, July, that inventory levels shrunk to multi-year lows throughout the US and Europe. So you had to restock a lot of that inventory. So there are many reasons why liner rates 
fell apart, uh, but were buoyed in the first half of the year and then rallied strong in the second half of the year. A lot of it was to the supply capacity discipline by the big liner companies. And then on the back half of the year, it's been all about demand. There are zero blank sailings now. There's like zero idle fleet. Every vessel that's on the water is full. There's congestion, there's delays in the canals, things of that nature. But for the time being, it's all systems go. And as you've seen, rates for these boxes, for the 20-foot equivalent units, the 40-foot equivalent units, are at all-time highs. You just look at the SCFI, you look at the trade, trade Coast Index, anything and everything, rates are booming. Yeah, and uh, you mentioned the blank sailings and the capacity management. It seems there's been a real change in the fundamental nature of the liner business due to all this consolidation. And, you know, I would think that this really uh, uh, improves the the outlook uh, for uh, the liner equities and some of the names that we have going forward. Absolutely. It was a big structural change, right? There wasn't really the opportunity to show how um, beneficial consolidation has been until this past spring and early summer. And it kind of shows that, look, they can pull on and off supply very quickly to kind of keep rates at decent levels. So for the last four or five years, on average, the SCFI, uh, which is a global average of TEU rates, has been between $800 and $1,000 per box. Currently, that's up to $2,800 per box, right? So now, rates are certainly going to fall from these levels, don't get me wrong, but we don't see them going back below $1,500, much less below $1,000 in the next year or two, right? With what we've seen on the capacity discipline side, and what we see on the prolonged demand side. So as you mentioned, some of the liner companies, you know, we recently initiated on Zim, um, ticker ZIM, and right, they've already guided to 1Q being a record, 4Q was a record, 3Q was a record, right? So all these records are going higher and higher. Half Egg Lloyd, for example, they recently also said that 1Q is gonna be a record, right? So you're seeing very, very strong rates, very strong profitability for all the liner companies, and that's even with higher bunker fuel expenses, higher ship rates when they charter in their vessels from some of the lessors and the owners, which we'll get to in a minute, they're still obviously achieving record profitability. So 2021 is going to be a very good year for these liner companies. Okay, great. So great timing on the Zim IPO. Let's, let's uh, move on to uh, the ship lessors, which is by far the largest category uh, in the U.S. listed sector, um, you know, most carriers uh, will will own a portion of their fleet and lease in a portion of their fleet. So someone like Maersk may uh, lease half of their fleet and someone like Zim pretty much leases their entire fleet. And there, there are two main uh, drivers I see for the fundamentals of these container, uh, 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 container ship leasing stocks. Number one would be counterparty risk. Uh, what is the chance that the liners are going to make good on their leasing arrangements. And number two is the charter rates, the prevailing charter rates themselves. So let's start with counterparty risk. Uh, that spiked uh, in 2016, around the time that Hanjin collapsed, and it spiked in March of last year uh, when everyone thought the world was gonna end. Uh, the French carrier CMA CGM has some bonds. And I think at one point uh, in March, they were trading at 55 cents in the dollar, uh, but they're now back towards par. So would you agree to me, uh, agree with me that um, the counterparty risk aspect of these container ship uh, lesser stocks, uh, uh, that's, that's off the table? Uh, absolutely. And you had a great point there with the CMA CGM bonds, right? Going from 55 cents on the dollar in March to above par currently. Zim, they have some public bonds as well. Same pricing scenario. So right at the beginning of the year, counterparty risk was really all we talked about when it came to the lessors and the container ship owners. But now that is no longer an issue, right? These liner companies, as we just discussed, are making record profitability. Their balance sheets are in much better shape. So right, the, the liner company container, kind of the counterparty risk there um, is certainly absolved, um, if not you know, completely gone. Yeah, and I would also think going back to the point of the fact that the liner structure has changed and that they're able to manage capacity, uh, that if that's a structural change, then that reduces the counterparty risk of container ship lessers structurally going forward. Absolutely. And, and then the fears of bunker fuel going to $1,000 a ton with IMO 2020 and DSFO and all of these things. Yeah, you know, bunker fuel 
would be a lot higher than it was now if you didn't obviously have COVID-19 and the demand destruction for crude and jet fuel and diesel. But again, with the supply of VLSFO out there, with a lot of scrubbers being installed, we don't think there's going to be a huge kind of um, spike in VLSFO prices or your bunker fuel expense. So again, the, the liner companies are in much better shape financially. And then let's let's move on to the the charter rate uh, exposure. I mean, you know, the charter rates now are historically high, but if you look at the different uh, ship lesser companies, they all have a different profile. I mean, some of them will lease a ship uh, for 18 years, which is essentially the entire life of the vessel, and that's more like a financing arrangement. Uh, whereas uh, uh, other companies will be leasing ships for a period of months. So it all comes down to uh, you know, which companies have uh, leases that are maturing right now at a time when these rates are high so that they have the ability to sort of double or even triple the rates that they have had before and even lock in uh, longer um, uh, rate uh, charter durations. And you cover a lot of these uh, 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 stocks. And I'm wondering if you could just go, you know, through uh, some of these companies and and you know, how this charter rate exposure that varies from company to company has played out. Yeah, it, it is pretty diversified, right? Uh, and as you mentioned, what you see on the biggest ships, 10,000, 15,000, 20,000 TEU, right? To build those ships for the lessors, the owners to build those ships, they're going to want a 10, if not 15, if not 20, uh, right, year charter against them. Because that's a high CapEx proposition and a high residual risk proposition if you're just doing that on spec. Whereas the smaller ships, the 8,000, the 6,000, the 4,500 TEU vessels, those, you know, you, you'll probably buy and you can acquire, uh, you won't build them at this point, but you'll acquire them even on one or two year charters because they're a lot smaller, there's a, a lot larger um, kind of demand for those, a more diverse demand for those, right? You have more customers. Uh, because they're smaller ships, they fit into more ports, all of those things. So on the companies we cover, you've seen some of both, right? On Atlas, formerly C-SPAN, uh, they just did 10, 15,000 uh, TEU container ships with Zim, partnering with them for 18 years, right? So very large, very large ships for very long-term charters, uh, brand new. They're coming in 23 and 24. On the other side, Global Ship Lease, GSL, They've done seven Panamax vessels built in 2001 on average, so around 20 years of age, 6,000 TEU, and those charters are only for about three years. So again, because they're so much older, so much smaller ships, they're willing to take a much shorter duration contract. Um, now, our top pick in the space has been and is the Naus Corporation, ticker DAC. Right, they've signed 27 new time charters in the last three months, all of them at two to three times the rate of the expiring charter and the durations for two to three times the duration. So the charters that they were signing in the spring were six months, maybe nine months at eight to ten thousand dollars a day. Now they're signing charters for 18 to 24 months at twenty five to thirty thousand dollars a day. Right. So. Pretty much all the lessors, the owners, have a kind of cascading, a, a ladder approach to their time charters. The biggest ships are still on time charter for at least two, three, four more years. The smaller ships, those are probably on time charter for six, 12, 18 months. So it's really a, a staggered chartering portfolio. Um, but as you mentioned, now that the balance sheets are much better at the liner companies, the counterparty risk is gone. For the owners, the lessors, their balance sheets as well have improved dramatically over the last one to two years. And then their earnings potential. Now, it's no longer rechartering risk for some of the expiring charters coming up. It's rechartering opportunity. And that's why we like Global Ship Lease, GSL. That's why we like the NALS, ticker DAC. And you know, one other thing to bring up before we move on to the next uh, category would be that, you know, uh, if you look back in the past, you know, the container ship lessers have, have been on the front end of damage when there's an overcapacity situation. And as we know, uh, the, the new build situation out there is much different than it was in the past. You know, that we're, the ships are being ordered for uh, renewal, but we're really still at around 10% of the fleet. Uh, so that risk as well has reduced going forward. 
Absolutely, yeah. You're down to a 40-year low on the order book to food ratio, right? 10%, as you mentioned. And 0% from 6,000 to 9,000 TEU. So there's like nothing on order in that kind of post Panamax larger intermediate um, asset class. Basically, the ships on order now are 12, 15, 18, 20,000 TEU or the very small feeders, right? Two to 3,000 TEU. So that intermediate level, uh, it's very light on the supply side. So all that being said, we're seeing supply growth of maybe 3% this year, maybe a little less in 22, whereas demand's probably gonna grow 5%, if not more this year and next year. So the supply demand fundamental backdrop is robust. And that's why they're able to secure 18 to 24 month time charters at 25, 30, $35,000 a day. All right, well, let's move on to the box equipment lessers uh, and just talk about them briefly. Uh, this is a different market. Uh, you know, a ship takes two years to build. Uh, in a normal market, it, you know, maybe it takes six to eight weeks to order a, a new container and get it delivered. Of course, this is not a, a normal market. Uh, but there are some big names out there in this in this space, uh, Triton, Textainer, CAI. They have the same drivers uh, as the ship lessers in a way, counterparty risk and charter rates. Uh, and, it, you know, the world is short of boxes. So these guys are doing fantastically lately. When you are a, a liner company, Zim, for example, you're chartering in the tonnage from the container ship owners, the lessors. You're also chartering in the equipment, the individual TEU, SEU boxes for those charters, right? So that market has certainly soared as well. Uh, you just look at those stocks that you mentioned there over the last year. Um, but again, the supply outlook um, isn't as visible as the container ship supply outlook because of the duration of new building. For these large container ships, we're talking 18, if not 30 months on the containers themselves, six weeks, eight weeks, right? Um, and now there's obviously a lot more building in China and other places because of the shortage of the actual boxes. So that is a very similar market uh, to the container ships and, and container line are very similar demand drivers, but the supply function is a little different in that regard. Sure, sure. And then just to sort of change the topic for a bit and switch gears, uh, there's I just want to focus on the investor base itself uh, for these container shipping stocks. Uh, there has been uh, a lot of focus lately on retail uh, and day traders uh, with GameStop uh, and, and that kind of trading. Uh, and at the same time, uh, there's also focus uh, on the institutional side uh, with this, this idea of a rotation uh, from from growth to value. And, you know, uh, you know, both aspects are important for a shipping stock. But I'm wondering if you could just talk a bit about, uh, you know, briefly about each of those categories and what's going on there. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and we've seen it across the shipping sector, right? We cover 31 different shipping companies. Um, five, six of them are containers, container ships, uh, but everything's up kind of year to date. Now, the container ship trade is obviously much better. DAX gone from three to 40, right? But still, uh, a lot of it's similar fundamentals and in the outlook for investing, right? If you have a rotation from momentum and growth names into economically sensitive value, um, global trade oriented names, shipping is the place to be, right? That's why we're very bullish on shipping and in container ships specifically. On the retail side, because some of these stocks are small market cap, thinly traded, you get some of that retail trading. But at the same time, DAC is now 800 million market cap. Zim is over a billion. Uh, some of these other names are a billion plus, right? So you, you do get some institutional investors and some long-term holders because of those structural supply demand changes and the attractive outlook that we discussed earlier. Exactly. So I guess that the main point being, this is a good time to be investing in uh, container stocks. I'm with you on that. It's, and we've been saying that since August and uh, so far so good. So Randy, I mean, I, I, if, if someone out there wants to, uh, you know, look at your work and, and, and cover, see what your coverage is, uh, how can they reach out to you? Yep, uh, my email is rgivens at jeffries.com. Um, pretty public, you go to any of these companies, investor relations pages, see the analyst coverage, uh, you can get my email there. So reach out to me directly and uh, we're pretty vocal and we write a lot on the space. So happy to talk. Fantastic, well, Randy, thank you. Uh, thank you once again, it's been a great conversation. Appreciate it. 
Awesome. My pleasure. Always good catching up. Have a great day. Bye, man.